And now, part two of The Big Fix, season one, episode 17, The Delicious Recap. Scene three, I like that we get another dinner scene. Everybody's going to be eating. They're talking about what's the results of a technically Eddie and everybody's exams because we find out it's midterms exams. That's why Eddie was freaking out. That's what he was so nervous about. We've got the family eating Matt. Uh, baked potatoes, very large potatoes. Okay, it's good that you say that because when Carl was holding up his plate, I was like, "Is that a very seasoned potato? Is that a very is is that a is that a like a large burrito? Like, what the fuck was that?" <laughs> It looked massive compared to everything else on the plate. And I was like, that's either really seasoned or maybe they like tried to like cut the potato open like a package because it was massive compared to everything else, which they're supposed to be having steak and then some kind of green vegetable. But the steak looks like little carrot sticks compared to everything else on that plate. I didn't see any steak. Maybe I was like so caught up on this bloated looking potato that looked like it was going to explode at any moment. Uh, But I, I didn't I didn't catch a steak. So I'll have to rewatch that moment um i did note that when carl was up to make a toast to his wonderful children of chicago at the dinner table uh he had a very cosby looking sweater on i did pick up on that um i think it really brought out like the cosminess of the sweater was really brought out by the fact that carl chose to wear blue jeans with it i think mm-hmm, what mm-hmm. made bill cosby so great with his trademark cosby sweaters was that because he often wore them with like dress pants i think typically like black dress pants or something that that it sort of blended in as sort of this like, oh, this formalized fashion trend. When Carl does it, it's like, oh, okay. So, yeah, all right, you're, 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 this is a comment on what is the number one show in America literally at the time, but also because it's Carl Winslow, not Bill Cosby, we're going to try to mix it up with the, oh yeah, he's, you know, casual, goofy dad man. Yeah, it's... It's dad on a Saturday taking his kids to the park. That is what his sweater is. I'm like, what is this thing when he came out in it? But we don't really see Carl in a lot of these like bolder prints. So I thought it was a okay choice, but it was an interesting one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then uh, there's a moment where Mama Winslow commends Judy for like the positive reception that she got from her teacher in class. Judy, of course, explaining that like, oh yeah, thanks, you know, Rachel, Mama Winslow for, you know, helping me out with the art project stuff. So this is where I find out that, oh, okay, this was not like individual arts craft time. This was all to help Judy with her project. And then she mentions um, like the covered wagon that Mama Winslow Mm -hmm. helped her make and i didn't know what it was did you know what a covered wagon was before this yeah i knew what a covered wagon was just because i went to school down south you kind of learn about them a covered wagon it's a wagon that travelers would use specifically i think pioneers that has a canopy that goes over a boned frame if you've ever played oregon trail that's what you're kind of looking at perfect your definition was much better than the google definition that i brought up so i i like that i like like that. Um, yeah, I mean, is that something that Amish people would be in, do you think, nowadays? Possibly. I mean, I've seen, like, carriages that have, like, the single horse and buggy. So if they had something big to transport and they didn't believe in using cars, that would probably be one of the best things to use. Got it. Got it. And then I love that moment when Rachel asked Judy, like, oh, you know, what did what did the teacher think about my lawn cabin? <laughs> and Judy, I think, I think I had that moment where I was like, wow, this is coming from a child and it's both confusing and funny. It's just something that you would not expect a child to say. Remember when Judy was like, oh, uh, I just, you know, told the teacher to set it on fire and call it an Indian attack. I was like, whoa, OK, that's a, that's that's quite a layered joke. <laughs> It, it, there was a lot of layers to this. I'm like, wait, we've got pyromania. We've got trauma coming up. Like, this was an interesting joke for them to have her make. Damn, the log cabin was that bad. Uh, but you know what? Giving Judy her flowers, giving Judy her big laugh. Probably her biggest laugh of the episode, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, this was the biggest laugh and reaction from the crowd for her episode. And I thought it was, like, perfectly timed, perfectly acted out, where it was funny, but it was still innocent, where you're like, oh, Judy, this is too cute. You, you want to burn things. Child actor arsonist. What a cute thing. <laughs> Judy the Pyromaniac. It's okay. It'll be a spinoff series. Yeah, no, I think just that line was just the essence of like a lot of moments where I'm saying something very crazy and out of bananas and I see you. Like, like I don't know. I think there was a moment in a past episode where I created the term prostitute monkey and you were like, <laughs> what is prostitute? Like, 
I, I, you've had those moments. I have those moments where you are really, tr you're both trying to process the logic of what somebody said, <laughs> and, but you're also like laughing at just the insanity of what they said at the same time. I just love those moments. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I'm you trying not to laugh for hard right now. It's, okay. This sidebar. I saw the Planet of the Apes tr new trailer for the new movie. And now all I'm imagining is prostitute monkeys being in that world. The Planet of the Apes. <laughs> planet of the Prostitute Monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> Of that and then you know when carl hasn't sat back down like i'm just noticing oh yeah he keeps standing you know after he made the toast because he has no chair like the chair that he's trying to fix he's still in the process of fixing it and then urkel he eventually comes in what is that type of jacket that he's wearing i thought all i could think of was like oh is that a carhartt ish kind of jacket it looks kind of carhartt ish like biker ish jacket I don't really know how to define it because I noticed his jacket and I was like, this is a little more rigid for than what we normally see, see Steve in. Yeah, he is, is certainly has, he usually has very quirky animated take on his nerd fashion. And I thought this one was very like, oh, I'm in my John Deere truck, like picking up wood, putting it on the truck and then going out to drink Bud Light all day, like that kind of thing. <laughs> It was a very industrious. He was lumberjackish, so I can see that. He was going out to push the pins to get people to cut down the trees. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And then, uh, and yeah, you you bring up the, the 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 whole you know mentioning steak thing. Well, first of all, Urkel coming in, and then he's like sniffing, like what's that? Like I, I just love the idea that like across the street somehow he could just smell what's cooking in the Winslow kitchen. That's that's a very dog-like sense of smell. So good for you, Urkel, I guess. They aren't feeding him next door and that's why he's eating rats and worms and have spiders crawling around his house. He is in danger and we are getting signals from Steve that the Winslows are not addressing. Okay, so you're saying that he both is used to this diet, maybe likes this strange diet of rats and mice, but maybe subconsciously he's like, oh, there's a world out there with real food and I think I could smell it a mile away. <laughs> This is probably what's happening because if they're only feeding him rats and worms, he wants something delicious. And that potato looked like it. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll take that. Um, and then, you know, when he was, uh, I think after he did that whole sniffing thing, he was like, mmm, steak. You've been to the slaughterhouse? <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> Fascinating. One minute, moo. Next minute, rump roast. <laughs> All I thought of was PETA in this moment. I'm like, Steve would be the excellent PETA person to speak for animals right now. I still don't think I would eat it. But after that, I couldn't eat it if I'm thinking about where your meat comes from. Yeah, that Winslow family, you know, of course they respond how anybody would respond. They wouldn't respond how I would respond, you know? Like you eat a hamburger and it's delicious, but when you think of how it was made, like, oh God, this cow got slaughtered, blah, blah, you're like, no, no. Like you equate it to someone talking about poop at the table. And it is this sort of weird contrast, you know? Like, eh, yeah, we know what it, takes to make this delicious burger and steak, but let's just avoid it. Let's pretend that it doesn't exist. I also thought when Steve was describing this whole thing about how cows, cows get slaughtered, he seemed to do it in a very delightful, sinister way, as if like, hmm, maybe this kid just like kills cows and just laughs giddily <laughs> afterwards. Did I do that? <laughs> That's Steve's hostel. <laughs> That's Steve in a hostile universal timeline here. Murdering Steve, watching cows get killed. Maybe it's his kink. That could be his thing. You know, the enemy of PETA isn't meat eaters. It's Steve Urkel. Just like they literally have a poster of Steve Urkel. And it's him talking about, you know, mmm, moo, and then muck roast. I don't know if anybody out there has seen it. If you're listening, if you watch, if you are not prepared for it, there's a movie called Meet Your Meat. And it's like what Steve does where you're like, oh, so now I know where this comes from. That's what I thought of when he made that joke. But then at the same time, looking at everybody's face, I'm like, this is such a real life scenario that I've dealt with. And I know people who are vegan deal with all the time where people think we're going to do that to you at the table. And that's not what's going to happen. I got to watch that. What's it called again? Meat your meat. So M-E-E-T, your M-E-A-T. There you go. Uh, I'm not going to make a. am not going to make a penis joke. So I'm going to move on. <laughs> it's right there. It's just right there. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, that's a straight guy thing to do. That's just like, mm, 
but you know what? I'm going to move on. This is family matters. Let's clean. <laughs> so. Yeah. I, no, no. I, my, my thing I was going to say was like, oh, yeah, I already met him. It's in my pants. But, you know, that's that's all I was going to say. Let's move on. <laughs> God, we're such not a clean show. Oh, yeah, yeah. So Steve asking Eddie if they can talk in private and Eddie leads him to the living room. Man, Eddie is loving this, this tucked in turtleneck with the black jeans look. We see this for a good portion of the episode. What do you think about that look? We do. This is my favorite look on Eddie the entire episode. This is where he has on that kind of dark greenish turtleneck thing with his black pants. And at the top of the turtleneck, there's this like lavender-ish burgundy colored like second collar. I don't know if you noticed it. And it's like this random little pop of color in his outfit that just kind of works so well for him. Yeah, there was just something very hip. 90s young going out for like a drink at the bar like that 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 vibe i was getting from the whole tucked in turtleneck and jeans thing and then uh, eddie happily exclaimed that like he got to be in map like he's you know trying to celebrate with steve and uh eddie brings in steve for a high five remember that moment like steve misses mm. bumps into the swinging room door or the, the the kitchen swinging door and i was like hoping that julia was okay because that seemed like a rather aggressive bump <laughs> like, it seemed like that would have killed that little kid <laughs> it seemed like it really hurt i looked up the television four separate times when i saw that and i'm like oh was that real or did he like literally fall yeah I don't know. I just hope that uh, Jaleel took a lot of stage combat training because, you know, he, he he can get heavy with the physical comedy at times. He really can. Did you notice that there was a lot more physical comedy in this episode than what we've gotten so far? Yeah, yeah. I was literally at that later scene the where Steve and Laura have their date. I almost put down the term slapstick orgy in my notes and I didn't because I just thought orgy seemed a little bit intense. So I just put like chaos. It's a lot. It's a lot. And I cannot wait wait till we get to that point as for now i mean i remember um like when steve confirms that like you know eddie can repay him by setting up him up I, and this might be the first time that eddie that uh steve confirms how eddie can repay him i don't think we have the mention of like oh hey you know set laura up with me until now so you know steve confirms eddie you can repay me set laura up with me for this friday night for a day and we know it would come and we know it's wrong because it's essentially, you know, we're prostituting Laura, a family f- friendly version of it, at least. But I- I- I'm trying to get into the acceptance mode of like, if we constantly complain about the wrongness of the Steve and Laura dynamic, then we'll never get through this show. So <laughs> let's just say it's wrong. And then we keep moving. <laughs> you have to. I-, I am with you. I have that the same way I have Jaleel and Judy being on screen together. Well, Steve and Judy being on screen together. I'm like this. I have to get past because I'm looking at this comedy as like now where I'm like no this would never fly and somebody call HR right now so I did like that we got another moment with Eddie and Steve and we're seeing their dynamic build a little bit more Steve is the nerd who both is looking at Eddie like, oh, God, you have so much to learn, but also like, oh, hey, here's my ticket to Cooldom. And Eddie looks at Steve as, I think, for now, mostly a way to, like, use him for his own benefits. I don't think we've gotten quite to the point, or maybe we'll never get to the point where Steve, where Eddie looks at Steve like a genuine, entertaining friend to have around. Yeah, I don't think we get that, not even until, like, the eighth or ninth season. And even even then, they're still friendly, but they're not friends. You don't think when Eddie becomes Steve in that time machine thing that that changes their friendship for the better? <laughs> that episode will stick in my mind forever. But I had hoped that they would build a better friendship. But I don't think it happens. We've got scene four and we have Eddie going to talk to Laura about going on a date with Steve. Of course, Laura is like, no, I don't want to do it. But Eddie explains his case and they have some good dialogue here. But really the big thing that stuck out to me in the scene Laura stole the scene with that shirt. Her fashion in this scene, I love. I mean, everybody's I love. But that shirt, I want it. That was cute. Okay. 
So you're right. Laura really knows how to stand out with her fashion. It it it, it brought my it, it got to my attention too because I was like, okay, that's like a white button down with what the entire city of Paris on it. Like there was a lot happening in that shirt. W- what did it look like to you? The only thing that stuck out in my head. Have you ever seen the video for "Take on Me" by Aha? No, I've heard the song millions of times, but I've never seen the video. The video it's all a hand drawn sketch, and there's people moving through scenes, and I think some of the scenes actually take place in Paris. That shirt, I immediately thought of that music video when I saw it. And I was like, this looks so cool. And then we had the little random splashes of color in her headbands, well, her hair ties that matched the shirt. I was like, they knew what they were doing. This is when wardrobe got a pay raise. Okay. Yeah. Um, Some choices of Laura in terms of fashion we have not agreed with, but I think this one, maybe this could have, this could have started the, the more positive direction of Laura's fashion choices. I'm, I'm hoping it'll be more up than down from here. Did you notice Eddie's turtleneck changing? Yes, I did. But they kept him in that same silhouette. They liked that silhouette on Eddie. And what I'm mad about, and I forgot to mention it earlier, Eddie, throughout this entire episode, is dressed like a Bobby Brown backup dancer. And then he gets a B on his exam and he still doesn't go to see Bobby Brown. It just throws me. We need some Bobby Brown concert love in this piece. But but no, I think the closest we're going to get is that new edition reunion episode later on in in the show. Why did Eddie, in the last scene, he had a striped turtleneck, a striped dark turtleneck, and then this scene, he just has a solid colored dark turtleneck, and I think the same black pants. Uh, So I was wondering if it was either a continuity issue or uh, Eddie is just so into this look that he's like, oh yeah, let me just slightly change it up. Striped, solid, solid, striped. (laughs) (laughs) Either it was he switched it up on his own, or they knew Laura's shirt was really busy, so we can't have Eddie walk in here with a really busy shirt on, too. That is a good point, you know? Eddie is sort of dark and brooding, and Laura is like, hey, Parisian, and aha! (laughs) All she needed was a beret. Give her a beret. And then Eddie, of course, he's walking in with the weight of the world on his shoulders, so he's like, let me put on some gloomy colors so Laura will feel more sorry for me what I'm about to ask her to do. And it's fitting that you say beret, and I say that her shirt looks like the entire city of Paris because, you know, Steve and Laura, they go to a fancy French restaurant later on. What uh, Laura should have came in with that beret. That would have been a presence. That would have been. John, they're leaving us little breadcrumbs to tell us what's going to happen later. Yeah. Damn you, Sally Lapidus and Pamela Eels for your little, uh, <laughs> little, little, little crumbs there. In this scene, I appreciate Eddie being direct with Laura about promising uh, Steve a date with her. I thought that Eddie was going to be sort of vague and tiptoey around it. Like, oh, hey, Steve, he's a cool guy to hang out with. Like, what do you think about just hanging out with him as a friend? Because he needs more friends, right? Like, I thought he was going to take that approach. But um, no, he just pretty much comes out and said, you know what? I promised Steve that he would go out on a date with you. What do you think? (laughs) I I applaud Eddie for being very upfront about it. I do think that it is less skeevy because he asked Laura, what does she want to do in the scenario? But it is still un-okay because it was created in the first place. I'm right with you on that. Thank you, Eddie, for being direct about that. Um, And we see Laura react the way you would imagine her to react. Eddie, he of course does that guilt thing where it's like, oh, well, Laura, you'll you'll make Steve's dreams come true if you go out with him. Right away, the, the therapy in me came in. We're only responsible for our own feelings, not someone else's. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and also, she just doesn't want to go out with Steve. That's probably the, the headline here. Not that, oh, you'll make Steve feel better. Like, it doesn't matter. She doesn't want to go out with him. Case closed. <laughs> yeah, it should have been a done deal as soon as Laura was like, nope. I mean, the scenario should have never arisen. But we're seeing a, like, pattern here of everybody in this family pressuring other people to do other things that they don't want to do. And it just kind of has trickled down from Carl to the rest of the family throughout these episodes. Yep. And that's why I was surprised why you weren't as uh, fiery and frustrated with the adults as I was in this episode, because they're giving that terrible example. I mean, yeah, there are things 
things in life that you have to do, even though you don't want to, like paying your bills. You need to pay your bills because you need to have a roof to live under. That's life. But when it comes to dating, no, I think you should have choice. <laughs> dating should be 100% choice. <laughs> there should be no forceful dating. I just don't believe that's actually a date. That's more just a hostage with a really title attached to it. Mm -hmm. And then I noticed Laura giving that Harriet sass to Eddie when she like is taking in all this shit about, you know, being set up with Steve. And she was like, well, you know, Eddie, you should have given him something you could deliver, like a ride on the space shuttle. And then she like shoes Eddie away with the, you know, sort of attitude black mom hands that my mom has done many a time. And she just awkwardly like goes up the stairs. There's something about the way Laura dramatically exits. She did this thing in Laura's first date where she doesn't do a convincing, natural, dramatic run. She just sort of like does an awkward shuffle of some kind. I did notice it. <laughs> she kind of runs like... um Whenever, like, the girls on 90210 would do, like, a dramatic runaway from something, that's kind of how Laura runs, and it doesn't really correlate well with her. And I don't understand why they made her run that way. I don't know. I mean, I don't even know if it's um, a direction from Rich. I think that literally all Rich could say is, okay, you're mad about Eddie doing this, and we need you to do a dramatic exit up the stairs. And I think it's up to Kelly to create that moment, to do what feels naturally to her. And I think as a kid, she, I mean, especially being, I think, a preteen, I think she is sort of in that self-conscious stage where it's like, oh, okay, I got to put on a performance. I got to be very actory and dramatic here rather than just being in the moment, being that person. Um, I don't think it's something that she would fully understand until she becomes an adult. So that's my uh, theory. Um, I will say good for Laura for standing her ground and not giving in to the guilt of Steve in that moment. <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I wish it mm -hmm. carried on for the entirety of the episode. Uh, but also to that space shuttle comment, I think we had... I I think we just foreshadowed the series finale. I think we did. This is where they dreamed it all up. Uh, yeah. I don't know if uh, Sally and Pamela, the writers, were on the staff in season nine, but um, yeah, no, Steve essentially goes on a NASA mission of some sort in like a two-part series finale. Well, it turned out to be a series finale, unintentional series finale, I should stress, but uh, yeah, that's how the show ended. And then um, my last point about this scene was Darius and his occasional teenage actory non-convincingness. Uh, like when he delivered that line, Laura, listen to me, please. Like he very well could have been like, Laura, Laura, listen to me, please come out. Like he could have, but he was just I don't know. He seemed a little bit more calm and monotone. Laura, listen to me, please, please. Like, it just seemed like that. Yeah, he didn't sound convinced himself of the line he was delivering there. It was very lazy how he delivered it. So our next scene, we've got a fade in. Carl, Harriet, Rachel, and Mama Winslow are in the kitchen, and Carl still hasn't fixed his chair yet. And yes. I love this because I don't know if you picked up on it, Laura walks in in the kitchen in this scene and I feel like she breaks character and I screamed because when Carl's on the chair sitting super sitting super low I just was like wait is she laughing and I feel like she was laughing and she wasn't supposed to laugh when she stormed in the kitchen. It's funny that you say that. I did not notice Kelly bring character in that moment. I did think that she might have broke character when she was like holding her um, head to her hand in embarrassment, like in the date with Steve as he was doing all of his slapstick chaos shit. Uh, but in that moment, I didn't see that. I was actually thinking that you were going to notice Harriet seasoning her raw meat. Like she's actually putting some flavor into the raw meat because we I were- I didn't always, notice that. Yeah, we, we, we've always been saying that like you know oh you know harriet and her bland white people meals what the fuck but like there she is maybe joe marie payne was like was just like you know hey y'all in california i don't know how y'all do it but down in florida we season our chicken <laughs> good for you harriet seasoning food the one time you pick up seasoning i don't see you do it that is terrible on me yeah you mentioned carl excitingly brings the chair he's been fixing proclaims the job done and then you know it breaks the moment he sits down on it i do think that it was a very timid break of the chair like I don't want to make a terrible fat joke at the expense of Reginald but I feel like with how small that chair is and how fairly sizable Reginald is I feel like there should have been a more dramatic break of that chair but instead it was just a little timid quiet break of one leg and then it just kind of you know uh, slants to one side and that's it like it was just it seemed like a very rehearsed prop chair it did I thought the way the chair was built I thought it was gonna like break all the legs and spread out not just one breaks off I thought it was gonna be like bigger and 
And I would have wanted that. I thought that would have been a far more funny thing to do. But then I see why they saved the chair. I guess. Uh, and then Laura comes in uh, and she asked the adults in the room who are not adults in this moment. Just my opinion. <laughs> the adults being Carl, Harriet, Mama Winslow, and Rachel. You know, Laura, clearly she's in this mode of like, oh, I don't know. Should I go out with Steve? Like, am I doing the right thing by rejecting him? Blah, 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 blah. And Laura is. Is she's a she's a fucking naive kid. She's asking for advice because you know she looks up to these people. They're you know she's like, hey, they're grown ups. They probably know what to do. And she asked them if they ever went out with somebody because they felt sorry for them. And um, Harriet just immediately was like, oh sure. How do you think I met your dad? And and I had this mixed response of like, okay, yeah, that could be played as a joke. But I don't know. Maybe I was like working off of how the audience reacted to it. I, I I've sensed maybe there was more timid laughter from the audience that suggested that maybe Harriet might have been telling the truth. That that's how. How, what, what do you think? Do you think Carl and Harriet's love started with Harriet looking at Carl like, oh, God, you pathetic fool. I guess I'll go out with you. I mean, it could be. I do think that you're on the right lines, that it was a little cringy, the joke itself. I do think that their relationship is built on love. And maybe they didn't love each other when they first met because that's a real thing. And they didn't mesh. So maybe they had a couple tries of dating and boom, one time it just worked. Yeah, I mean, I totally get like not finding love from the first date that's completely understandable i mean it took a while for you know tony and i to get to that point where we said like oh i'm in love with you i think it is a totally different story if it starts out with like all right you seem to be asking me out and yeah you could use some work on your looks you could use some work on your diet you eat too much jelly donuts but you know Eh, you're persistent and I don't want to let you down. So, eh, you know. Uh, if it started that way, rather than like this mutual thing of like, oh, hey, like you seem to be an interesting person. Let's give this a shot. Then, you know, that that, that would uh, make me sad because I have such um, love for Carl and Harriet that I, I would hope that their love was a mutual affection for each other that began that way, you know? I do hope their love is not built off of pity because that just is not going to be good. Yeah. And then <laughs> this is where this is where uh, Mama Winslow and Rachel share their uh, stories of uh, going out on what these adults call mercy dates. <laughs> No, <laughs> Mama Winslow, I relate to her because she did something that I would do where she's like, I went on a date because I was hungry. And that is exactly what I would do. So Mama Winslow, like, she talks about like, I think, this, so this guy named Lucas Hobbs, who's a chicken farmer. And did he smell like feathers or was he always, I think he was always covered in feathers because he was a chicken farmer, right? Yes, he was always covered in feathers. And, you know, Mama, you know, she admitted that, you know, hey, you know, it was the Great Depression and I could get a good meal from it. Why, why not? <laughs> and I was thinking while I was watching that, I was like, this is literally the family friendly version of offering a blow job so you can get some McDonald's. Like, that's what I thought, like straight up. <laughs> I was like, this is some like low key McDonald's prostitute shit. Like, that's, that's what I thought. <laughs> That's it. like, all right, like I, I, I'm a, I'm a drug addict and I live in my car and I need some food or money for food. And, oh, you just came out of the McDonald's. Hey, how about a little hanky panky? For a little uh, panky? Not a blow job for a McDLT. That, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, you know, I would imagine that the food had to be a, as somebody who would go on a date just for the food. And I have done that. I can imagine that it's got to be a good restaurant if you're given a blowjob. Maybe like a handy for McDonald's because that is just not an even exchange. I Look, I, I guess I put McDonald's on such a low standard that it's like, oh God, like because, you know, let, let's be honest. I mean, you know, us, us people that are in the average working class and, you know, you have people who are unfortunately lower on the totem pole, like, yeah, McDonald's is an easily accessible, affordable, basic thing and, yeah, I don't know. I just had this Symmetry of, I mean, when Mama Winslow described what she described, it was like, oh, you're just putting like a polished, middle class, family friendly version on that uh, unfortunate person living on the side of the road who is like, hey, you know, let me put your mouth, let me put my mouth there for a little nugget. I mean, this just makes me wonder, John. Have you ever gone on a date just because there was food? No, I, I guess I've always used the stereotypical gentleman thing, where it's like, oh, if I'm going out on a date with you, then I want to treat you. I want to be able to pay for it. I want to be able to take care of it. So I've never, no. I mean, it, it, it's it's a totally, I would imagine that it's a totally different thing for straight men as opposed to gay men. Because I think with straight men, uh, 
but there is that sort of pressure stereotypical dynamic of like oh the man takes care of the of the meal of the date or whatever so possibly there there might have been a situation where i was on a date with a girl and she uh only saw it as an opportunity for free food uh but no i i get i think as the man who's straight who's buying into that whole societal thing i no i i've never never experienced that so but but you have and, and i would imagine that uh did you feel good about it afterwards or did you feel like kind of like oh god i i might have broken this person's heart <laughs> I felt good because I was full. I was full. I felt amazing afterwards. Um, I have done it where I've gone out with somebody just because I know that they are going to pay for dinner and maybe I wasn't fully interested in it. And then the date occurred and I'm like, yeah, I am very happy that you paid for dinner because this is the one thing satisfying from this date. So I've had those dates and I don't think it's a bad thing. Now, I do think there is a mutual respect that you should have on a date. Like, I'm not going to go and make you spend hundreds of dollars on me on dinner and then ghost you. That's not okay in my book. Don't ghost people. Tell them why you don't want to be with them if you don't want to continue it. And I would respect that more. But I have gone out and gotten a little cheeseburger or something because I was hungry and didn't have money at the time for a date. Now, that directness that you give to the person, uh, you know, letting you know that, hey, sorry, it's not going to work out. I wonder if you gave them the same directness about why you went on the date in the first place. Are you able to say, eh, I got to be honest, I needed a free meal and you were there. Have you ever been, have you ever gotten to that point? Because that's, that's, I, that's, where, that's where it needs to happen. <laughs> I have. I have literally told somebody, I was like, I agreed to our date because I was hungry and I didn't have money on my own at the time. And I was just flat out with them about it and they were like you know what i respect that and i was like thank you for respecting it damn all right i was because you know look i as someone i guess because i you know i i am in a position where i stereotypically would pay for dates uh you know yeah, I think it's easy for me to judge someone like you who's like, oh, really? Like, you're not even in this for the moral thing. You want to, you know, just get mooch off of my credit card. But in a world like dating where a lot of it is just cowardly behavior, like you ghost someone or you lie to make their feelings a little bit better. Directness, even if it does hurt. I've said many times, like, if you reject me, if you don't want to go out with me, even if you're the most beautiful person in the world, I, I think I'll be both hurt and disappointed, but also so like, hey, like you're you're keeping my mind from just rolling like you were direct and honest and now I can move on. So mm -hmm. I like that. I think we should have more of that. Yes. People be direct. Mm -hmm. Just be direct. It's easier. It's less messy. It doesn't get you into scenarios like what Laura goes through. Yeah. Oh, God. Let's go back to that, shall we? Um, oh, oh, oh uh, by the way, going back to Lucas Hobbs, she had a suggestive line about Lucas that I liked. Once he got me into the rumple seat, I didn't know where to, whether to kiss him or to pluck him. And I was like, oh, OK. The Family Matters writer's way of uh, speaking in the word fuck without actually saying it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even pick up on that. Good job, guys. Y'all disguised it. And we know Mama Winslow's a little bit of a rowdy one. So, ah. So is the so is the rumble seat, is that code for bed? Like, what is the rumble seat? I, I would imagine it's gotta be bed. I don't know what the rumble, unless maybe he was an attractor and, oh, maybe they had tractor sex. Maybe they were in a tractor and like the seat rumbles in the tractor. And then she was like, ooh, let me sit in the rumbling seat. That could, I, I mean, I, I don't know if I would consider tractor sex to be comfortable. Have you done that? <laughs> I have it, but I do want to. I feel like it would be a fantastic experience at least once. Okay? okay. With heavy equipment around. Wow. All right. That is, I, 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 I see quite a bit of tractors living in a rural state like Vermont. So I have a hard time picturing how that would be comfortable. So if you do that, you need to let me know how that goes. I actually was picturing vibrating bed. Remember when uh, Mama Winslow was referencing vibrating beds in the uh, stakeout episode where they were suspecting yeah. Carl? Of, yeah, where they were suspecting Carl of having an affair uh, in a motel with his female police partner. Um, vibrating beds have a rumble, rumble, double, double kind of noise. So they do. So a rumble seat. <laughs> I mean, maybe Mama Winslow's on to something. Yeah, or maybe they're just wrestling at the WWE Rumble. <laughs> I don't know. It could mean so many things. It could mean so many things. 
Um, so Rachel is talking about her mercy date with Clarence Bibby of that last name, Clarence Bibby. And it's also food related. She was like, oh, everything. Here's where I got confused. Everything that boy ever ate in his life was stuck to his hush puppies. I got different definitions of the word hush puppy when I was looking it up online. I was wondering if she was talking about the cornmeal cakes. Was she talking about his weight? Maybe the hush puppies was a reference to the weight. Was it the slang that I found on, I think, Urban Dictionary where, where, where it was like, oh, a hush puppy is a younger man who goes after an older woman. Didn't know that was a thing. I thought it was just, oh, you you like cougars. I thought that's how it was defined. What did you think it meant when, he, when she said hush puppies? So you've just blown my mind. The only definition I know of hush puppies is the little fried corn cakes. Yeah. And yeah, I, and, but but then when Carl follows up and asking Rachel, like, oh, Rachel, I didn't know that you were a hush puppy person. So I think it's, I think Rachel dated a younger man. I think that's what the reference was. Ah, oh, that's kind of <laughs> cute. Like, I want to be hush puppy. Like, that's the Mel Sugar baby. I, I probably, <laughs> I don't know. And then, oh God, this is, I think, where I start to just fucking really hate these adults. Uh, so Carl is asking Laura after Rachel's story. So, Laura, who's the loser in your life? I'm just thinking like, okay, you're a parent, probably a very mean question to ask of your child to kind of imply that, oh yeah, here's a person that you should label as a loser. Like that's, I don't know, that's that's like bully talk to me. It was, it was like bully talk. And the only thing that I thought of when I heard Carl say that was like, maybe he's like, oh, this is how I would talk to my son-in-law. But even then I'm like, this is kind of like bad. Like you're already disparaging everything and sounding like a bully talk towards Steve. Whatever. I mean, look, if it's son-in-law, I don't know, son-in-law talk, I mean, that's a, that's a whole different dynamic. Um, locker room talk between friends, that'll be what it is. Mm-hmm. Yes, we can accept the fact that a lot of mean, unacceptable things are said in locker rooms. When it's the dynamic between, between a parent and a child, that's where it hits me personally. That's where it's like, okay, the child is looking to you as an example for what to do. Like, what is the moral decision? What's the right decision? What's the wrong decision? And to, you know, make them think that there's this world where there are people considered winners and then there are people who are considered losers who's the loser you're dating it's like no that's a bad example of parenting now that you say that i can agree with that (laughs) because this was something that when i heard it it completely flipped my mind like went over my head where i'm like oh okay he's referencing steve but yes now you're setting a bad example for your child because who's the winners and who's the losers and are you saying that i deserve to date losers yeah. Uh, Laura makes it worse, though, because she was like, oh, this loser I'm dating is a world class nerd. So we have that 90s thing of putting that negative stigma toward nerds. Thank God nerd culture is a lot more accepted and, and praised than, than it was back in the day. But, you know, then Harriet follows up and it was like, oh, you know, world class nerd sounds like Steve Urkel. And then, you know, Carl, Harriet, Rachel, they're doing their mean bullying chuckles. <laughs> you know? And Laura was like, oh, well, I, it kind of is Steve Urkel. And then. Did you notice all of them, all three of them were like, ooh. And God, Carl's line would have been such a great line if it wasn't like steeped in meanness. Remember when he was like, oh God, that's not a mercy date. That's a Lord have mercy date. (laughs) (laughs) It was very unfortunate that they gave him that joke because it made Carl look like a bad person. Like he looked like somebody where it's like, well, why are you letting this kid in your house be so terrible? Yeah, it's just mean. It's just me. And the audience laughs. It's supposed to be played as funny, but in 2024, it just, it hits different. It just hits as, wow, you mean parents are not setting a good example for your child. And um, thank goodness for Mama Wins, though. I mean, she has that great dynamic with Steve. She ca- comes to his defense and calls him a fine young man. I wonder if it was necessary to follow up with, hey, you know, if I was a few years younger, then I'd give you a run for your money, Laura. Like, <laughs> I felt like, like, oh, okay. Eh. What, do you, what, do you, what did you think about that? Like full on cringe moment where I was like, this is not a funny joke because we're talking about something incredibly inappropriate. But I don't understand why they made her say this line in the first place because it doesn't fit with anything else about Steve being this sweet boy. It's just like, do we realize that an old woman is saying this? Yeah. I mean, it's one thing to say, like, oh, what a sweet, young, handsome man. You say that? That's perfectly fine. That perfectly comes from a place of innocence and a clear boundary of like grandmotherly figure and young boy figure. I think once it gets to, oh, if I was a few years younger, I'd hit that. It's like, okay, grandma. Okay. Okay. Go, 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 go back to eating your husk puppies with your chicken farmer named Lucas Hobbs, who you will suck off in the Great Depression because, you know, you need a good meal. <laughs> <laughs> it 
it is time for to take her to the home. I think we're losing a little bit of Estelle in that one little moment there. <laughs> oh my God. And then the scene just ends. I hated this, Andrew. I hated this. I hated that we had a big opportunity to learn something from this scene. The adults could have fucking said, hey, Laura, you know, you have a right to not go out with Steve if you don't like him. Don't make, don't be forced into going out with somebody. Don't feel like you have to be guilted into it. But no, what we got was, hey, Laura, look, we've been on mercy dates ourselves when we were younger. So we get it. Mercy dates are, I guess, a thing that you have to go through in your childhood. And then you'll laugh at later on when you're older. And then, oh, your mercy date is Steve Urkel. Oh, God. Well, OK, good luck with that. Go. It, like they made it seem like this weird rite of passage thing. And it's like, no, it does not have to be that. <laughs> it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. People could have talked about it. Now, even when I think about this being like, oh, the time that they were in, like, whoa, this is so long ago. It's not really that long ago. And people do have the right to choose what makes them happy, where they go on a date, who they date, who they interact with. And this was a dynamic that I'm happy you're bringing up because I actually did not even notice any of this to a flow really? where I was like, oh, Okay, like when I tell you the adults were so inconsequential for me in this episode, that this entire dynamic that you're bringing up, I did not really pay attention to. So what were you thinking about like as this exchange was going on? That? At that time, I was just like, oh, okay, Laura's going through something. Nobody's really acknowledging her. But I'm like, damn, I'm happy that we get to see more interaction with her, more lines with her, more character development that I was liking out of Laura as opposed to everybody else. Scene six, we get into it where Steve, Laura, and Eddie are going to be in the scene. Eddie and Steve are talking about getting Laura to go on the date. Eddie's letting Steve know, no, it's not going to happen. So he's, of course, like, how am I going to use my new Prince tickets? And that's where we lead into Laura coming in. Yeah, and I love, uh, <laughs> like, the Steve's moment of, like, oh, how am I going to use it? I could either give my other ticket to the guys at the chess club or I could give it to my allergist, Dr. Wu. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, I like the name Dr. Wu. That's a funny name. And also, um, Steve, this 13-year-old kid, which in 2024, again, I'm looking at it, I'm like, mm, I don't know, is it appropriate for an adult allergist to be friends with a 13-year-old patient? I don't know. But to a point where they go to a Prince concert, I feel like that's a boundary-violating thing. Definitely a boundary-violated. Um, this, again, makes me wonder, where are Steve's parents? Why is Steve friends with an adult allergist? Why does Steve have an allergist? That's like something for somebody who's way older than what Steve is right now. So that's a very specific doctor for him to have. Yeah. Was Benadryl existent in 1990? Because if it was, Steve, just take that. Yeah. I mean, unless Steve had some crazy <laughs> allergy where he can't go outside and like, this is a dynamic I'm not understanding fully. But this also is leading me to believe that Steve has more interactions outside of his home than he does with his own parents. And Herb and Diane are probably playing hide to seek again. Where are they right now? Are they uh, are they ironically in Sheboygan? Were they like, oh, you know, Carl Harry and Rachel and Mama Winslow, they didn't go. So let's go to Daryl's 40th birthday party. We'll hide out there. Nobody will suspect that we'll there. <laughs> That's where they are. They took that dirt road and they were just like, we'll figure it out. Steve will be fine. And uh, this is this is the moment where I noticed Steve's giant red Converse sneakers. This is the scene that yes. for whatever reason, he had those big ass sneakers on. Did you notice his foot size or were you just like, oh, those are red sneakers? The sneakers were hu huge. I noticed that. This is where he had on his sweater that I loved with these shoes. Like the shoes, sweater, and pants and this outfit that he's wearing could all be worn with separate items and look very fashionable today. Okay. And then we have Laura coming downstairs, clearly not excited to see Steve. And she's clearly feeling guilted into going out on a date with him because the stupid fucking adults from the last scene led her to believe that mercy date should be a normal thing Woohoo! <laughs> and i i do find it ironic that this was a double women written episode um i do appreciate little bits of empowerment that laura is given the empowerment could have been more fully fleshed out to have laura stand her ground and say no i'm not going out with you steve because i just don't want to but nonetheless i mean you know there's little bits here and there like when she tells steve like yeah i'll go out on a date with you but it's gonna be a non-date no touching and no one can know about it now that you bring 
that up that two women are the ones who are pretty much in charge of this episode, I think about this in a completely different dynamic. Maybe this episode is a commentary on what women could possibly feel when it comes to a scenario of being out in the dating world and dating somebody. Because yeah. so often women are told, I mean, just look at social media. Oh, you should just take this person as they are. You should settle in some cases for this. Lower your standards. Accept this. Accept less. As opposed to, hey, how can we get the individual who's actually dating them to do more or just be a decent human being as opposed to the woman always accepting less? And we're seeing Harriet's trauma, Mama Winslow's trauma, Rachel's trauma, being in those scenarios of accepting less or being forced into a date because it's the thing to do for you to be a woman. And they felt that they weren't able to speak about it. And then once they finally get into a scenario, where their daughter is now going through this. They're like, hey, well, I've been through it. I've been through it. I've been through it. And as opposed to having addressed that a trauma and changing that course of action, they're like, hey, we know it sucks, but you're going to make it to the other side. Because as a woman, you've got to accept less. Or if you decide to speak up and say you want something different or you don't want this, you're complaining and now you're undesirable. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You hit the nail right on the head. What you said gives me the same feeling that I felt when I saw America Ferreira give that monologue in Barbie about the mm -hmm. expectations brought upon about women, you nailed it right on the head. I didn't note specifically that it could have meant a lot for Harriet, Rachel, and especially Mama Winslow, because with Mama Winslow defending Steve the way that she did, she could have followed up with, hey, Laura, like, you don't have to go out with him. You don't have to accept what you find to be less. You can accept what you feel you deserve. But no. They seem to just kind of move past that and just go along with this idea that like, hey, it's just a part of life. Women will have to just go out on dates with men just because they feel sorry for them and they don't want to make them feel bad. We have to serve the man. We have to cater to the man's needs and feelings rather than what do I want as the woman? So 1990 for you. And I also thought that this moment was in this scene was it was an interesting look into Steve's lack of dignity within himself. And this is why I mean, this is basically why I liked the Stephen Myra dynamic more than the Stephen Lawrence dynamic because with Steve and Myra, it was like, oh, Steve, you found someone that is a lot like you that shares a lot of your interests. Um, and there was a moment that Steve was into that and they had this good thing going on. But with Laura, it's just simply like, oh my God, I love you. I'm obsessed with you. And Laura's like, oh my God, get away from me, you freak. Steve is willing to find this non-date contract just so he could say, I don't know, to himself, out loud to anybody, oh my God, I finally went out with the girl of my dreams, even though, you know, she doesn't like me in return. But we're not going to give a thought about that because Steve doesn't have that sort of integrity or self-esteem in himself that he could have gotten from his uh, parents if they weren't in fucking Sheboygan running away from him. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Urban Diane, get home and teach your kids some self-worth and confidence. Because like you said, him even signing the contract is already problematic where it's like, how about you go out with somebody who likes you? But then the other side of it of Laura, the fact that you feel like you had to make this contract just to feel safe to go on the state. We need to address the bigger picture here. This is not OK on either spectrum. He was looking for that love that he didn't get from his parents. That's what I think. I think that with Laura, it's sort of this like one shot minded thing of like, I got to get some acceptance. I got to get validation. I see this girl that I have a crush on. That's going to be my need for validation, for acceptance, for something. And I mean, he, he gets what he wants, but wow. <laughs> it could have been a totally different path for him. It could have been. I do like in our scene here, even though we have this very deep dynamic of what's happening, they try to soften the blow with some physical humor, which is still funny, but thinking about it in an objective lens, this is a pretty heavy moment where we're like, okay, they're really going to do this. They're really going to make this girl go on the state, even with her trying to get some reconciliation of power with this contract. But you would think by now someone would say, no, don't do this. Oh, Swing 7, we've still got Carl trying to go ahead and fix this chair. We've got <laughs> him standing away at this chair. And it, this just is looking worse and worse with this chair. It's time to let it go. Yeah. Um, and then Harriet tells Carl something to the effect of like, oh, Carl, you've been working on this chair forever. What gives? And then I love how Carl snaps back with a very suggestive question. He was like, Harriet. Do you want this fast or do you want it good? And I thought that Mama Winslow, like Mama Winslow would have been the perfect person to like follow up on the suggestiveness on that line. But, you know, it's family matters. They have to keep it clean. So she just simply said, uh, I think she, she said, I don't think he's got a shot either way. 
And so <laughs> this joke now takes on a whole different connotation to me because I only fixated on the chair. I thought they were talking about the chair. I didn't pick up on the adult humor that's in that joke. It might have not been intentional. I think it was just the way Reginald delivered it. Like he just had like a very like attitude like, hey. You want it or you don't want it. Like it just because I'm pretty I'm pretty sure you've met some people like that in your history with dating and sexuality where it's like, are, are we going to do this or what? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe you were like that. Oh, I've been that person. We know what we're here for. We can met on a hookup app. What are we doing? And then for some reason, you know. Here we go. Laura shuffle running. She's coming downstairs into the kitchen. She's wearing like, what is this? Like a Voldemort clo cloak that she has on right now. I was like, what are you, the evil witch from Snow White? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Her poncho hood thing. I was like, what is this? And where did you get this from? You know, obviously she doesn't want to be seen on her way to a date with a, a non-date, I'm sorry, a non-date with Steve. And then Harriet calls out to Laura because she recognizes her. Uh, Laura's like, oh, darn, you noticed me. And I loved Carl's, Carl's follow-up response because it wasn't like the pop culture reference that I was expecting. He was like, oh, well, it was either you or the Phantom of the Opera. And I was like, how many Family Matters fans back then were also Broadway musical fans, fans of Phantom of the Opera? That seems like two different audiences. It really did. It reminded me how old Phantom of the Opera is. I didn't realize it was out then early. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, probably like early mid 80s or something is when it popped out. It's been around for a while and not too long ago, I think like last year or something, it closed in New York City after running for a long time. So, yeah. Mind blown, mind blown. I did like that she tried to wear this outfit to get out of the house, but I'm trying to figure out why was she hiding from the family when they all know it's Laura? You're still at home. So like, I would have expected her to put that on as she was leaving the house, not just coming downstairs. Right. That would have made sense. Like, wear the cloak in public when you're out with Steve, when you could potentially run into a friend from school, at the house when you already, like, asked the family for advice on how to approach going out with Steve Urkel. It's like, with, there's not much of a secret there, Laura. Not much of a secret. Um, What was that coat that she was wearing? She was wearing sort of like an old person person's going out on a date trench coat thing and what was that pattern I, I think it's houndstooth i think i don't know if i'm right with my like patterns but i think it was houndstooth seemed a little bit old for a middle schooler to be wearing i don't know just something about it was like very distinguished it was it was a very distinguished jacket like i would expect to wear that to church on easter sunday or something yeah and then steve comes in with his whole gray suit and bow tie and then uh he has uh the flowers i think it was a box of chocolates so he's yes. approaching this date, Valentine's Day. It was. In the box of chocolates and the flowers were like the perfect show up. He's like that nerdy kid going on his very first date and doesn't know what to do. This was good because I knew we were getting get a setup for some good physical comedy as soon as I saw the box of chocolates. Oh, and boy, did we do that. By the way, this episode came out February 9th, 1990. So Valentine's Day was just a few days away. Oh, um, makes sense. As you mentioned, so Steve drops the flowers and chocolates on the floor. He cries <laughs> another classic line. I got nougat on my shoe. <laughs> I was waiting for that. How did he get the money for the flowers and chocolate? Was it, I mean, Herb and Diane, they are not anywhere to raise him. Did they give him like allowance money from California, wherever the fuck they are? Maybe, maybe it's his tutoring sessions. Maybe he got somebody to pay him. There, I have no idea where he got the money, but that was a big bouquet and a big box of chocolate. Yeah. Well, we eventually found out about his Uncle Ernie having a hearse. So maybe his Uncle Ernie gave him some money from his funeral service business. I mean, that is true. It could be a thing because Steve brought it up. Hey, we're going in a limo. Come to find out it's his hearse and they have to make a delivery before they get to their date. So maybe that's how you got the money. Yeah. And I was wondering, huh, with that quick delivery, possibly either a, it could be a dead mouse, a dead worm, a dead cow. I don't know. It might be a dead animal of some kind. <laughs> possibly. I mean, in a hearse, you can fit anything. So you never know. Or the last girl that rejected Steve. That poor girl. <laughs> <laughs> Things took a dark turn. Um, and then, you know, Steve is hopping on one foot because he wants to be able to go outside and rub that nougat off his shoe. Oh, God, and then this moment, he says goodnight to everybody, backs into the wall near the back porch door, and then he just said, oh, that thing that he did from the Laura's First Date episode, yeah, excuse me, as if the wall is like an inanimate object that he needs to apologize for, Bobby. I, I don't get that. I know you were like, oh yeah, I, I get that, that's funny. But to me, it's just like, it's just a strange, out-of-character thing for Earth. 
Urkel to be so clumsy that he finds inanimate objects to be the sort of people that he has to apologize to. It just, I don't know. It, it, it's not something that I'm like buying into. I love it still. Um, I mean, I say excuse me to dogs. Like I would be like, excuse me. And I know the dog does not understand me at all. But even with like an inanimate object, if I bump into something, my immediate reaction is like, oh my gosh, excuse me. So I find it to be hilarious when he does it. Dogs are living, breathing organisms. I say sorry to dogs and cats if I bump into them, whatever. I know they don't understand it, but I think there's something about like if there's a living, breathing thing in front of you and you bump into it, no matter what, like, sure. Yeah, you feel the need to say like, oh, excuse me, my bad. Uh, A wall? (laughs) The walls are alive. I don't know. Maybe they are. But uh, yeah, I I just found that funny. And then what's that? Okay, so Steve, he... Uh, so he backs into the wall and what is that on top of the back porch door is that like a horse frame structure thing what is that it's a copper horse and it's like a specific type of kitchen design if you've ever seen like sometimes in people's kitchen they keep little copper ornaments it's a thing in kitchens and i was looking it up it's actually a style stuff for kitchens back in like the early 90s and the 2000s to have these brass things or copper things and that's what that was it was a horse i don't think it had anything else with it but it was just the horse's body and when it falls down in between the door you got the horse's like butt tail and then the hind legs sticking out yeah and you know of course the audience loving when steve is uh trying to close the back porch door but he can't because like you said that hanging copper head thing just keeps on you know preventing the door from being shut because it's just hanging in between the door and the outside part and i just love how the adults like carl harriet they're all looking at this kid like what is going on and you would think that at least harriet would be like um hello like i spent money on this thing this is a part of my house design like stop doing that Let, let me take care of that um I would have laughed myself. I wouldn't have even stopped somebody because that scene, I screamed. I screamed. I laughed. That was the funniest moment I have seen so far in this rewatch of Family Matters because I found it to be so hilarious. But even in real life, I have some crap hanging above my door. And if that were to happen with somebody directly in front of me, I would just watch and laugh because I'm just watching them not figure out what's happening here. You and I would be different. I think the first time I watched that episode and that moment, I think I like had a moment of amusement. Like, oh, wow, this is some great slapstick comedy. I think now watching it again, I'm looking at it from other lens and I was just like, oh, wow, these adults just seem to not care about their uh, their house decor. And then to follow up, Carl somehow locks the door sh- shut when Steve is when he because I, I, I guess he just get, gets to a moment where it's like, okay, okay, Steve, you're not helping with trying to close the door with this copper horse thing. Let me just slam the door shut and, and get you out of here. And he doesn't even attempt to get the horse back into place on top of the back porch door. He just <laughs> manages to lock the door shut with that copperhead horse thing stuck in in between the doors so that was a moment that uh the audience clearly enjoyed i mean you're the studio audience in this moment andrew because the audience was laughing they were applauding i mean they, they loved this it was good it was a good scene i there's something about that in comedies where you see something occur and just the repetition of him opening and closing the door that's how you, this is the steep power of steve urkel right there and that's what i mean when i say they went full pedal to the metal like this was a full steve urkel moment that made me forget about everything else that happened before this scene eight we get to the restaurant this fancy fancy restaurant we finally get here and walking in immediately we know that we have a group of people who are going to be influenced by steve's hijinks right away as steve walks in and asks about his reservation um this restaurant it looked like the restaurant from seinfeld there's this french restaurant they go to have you ever watched seinfeld i have yeah a bunch of times it, i and i do remember restaurant scenes um what restaurant scene are you talking about i don't remember what the name of the restaurant was but elaine was on a date at a french restaurant and it looks exactly the same as this one. It might have been. It might have been. Um, I wonder what where, where Seinfeld taped. Got to look into that. I don't know if they taped uh, in the same area as Family Matters, but um, yeah, they very well could have used the same fancy restaurant set. I, I wouldn't be surprised. So this restaurant in particular where Steve and Laura are like, you know, there's elegantly dressed adults and then Steve and Laura come in. Uh, Steve, I love how he braggingly confirms like, oh, a reservation for Dr. and Mrs. Urkel. The, 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 I had the same question that I had the first time I watched this episode, which was like, middle schoolers can reserve 
at restaurants, like just by themselves, like there doesn't need any, like there's no parental supervision or anything. Like you could just be like a 12 or 13 year old and be like, hey, I want to go out on a date. Let's do it. Yeah, this was a very adult thing. Reservations wasn't even in my vocabulary until I turned 30. Understandable. And then Steve requests that the seats not be near the bathroom because he doesn't like the sound of flushing when he eats. I totally got that, by the way. I totally got that. I never thought about that. Because if you think about it, really, like, you know, you're eating and then you hear the ping and ping and whatever flushing sound the bathrooms make. <laughs> Sorry, I know that was a weird flushing sound, but no, I mean, if you're me, you automatically think about like, what just went down the toilet? And then like my filet mignon experience is ruined because now I'm thinking about the filet mignon that was just flushed down the toilet. <laughs> First of all, John, I think you have a French toilet if your toilet sounds like that. <laughs> <laughs> that was a very Parisian flush. Um, yeah, <laughs> but I, love it. I am with you. But for me, I don't even need to hear it. If I am sitting next to a bathroom, food will never be near me. This is the grossest thing in the world to me. I couldn't do it. So I get what yeah. Steve is saying, but I don't even want to know that there's a bathroom in the building. Okay. Yeah. And it's the worst but when you, if you go to a bathroom and restaurants and it's nothing like the restaurant experience, if your restaurant experience has been positive, if the food has been delicious, if the place has been well cleaned, and then you go to the bathroom and it's like, whoa, okay, I guess I'm at McDonald's now. Hmm. All right. I guess uh, I guess someone gave somebody a blowjob here for a Big Mac. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so inappropriate. <laughs> you know what? It just works. It all circles back. I see what yeah. you did there. Um, I, you know what? By being by the kitchen, being by the bathroom, definitely not something I would encourage or I would. But I do love how that they set up the scene here how Steve and Laura's table is the central focus of the restaurant, but it still looks natural. Like you would literally be sitting in this position where they actually do get set at. And then the klutzy slapstick chaos. We're just setting it up. This is going to be a really active scene. I, I remember Steve accidentally like smacking his hand on the back of someone's head when he's giving Laura that whole like, oh, ladies first, my dear, hand motion mm -hmm. over to their table. Um, there's another moment where Steve drops to the floor when he's just trying to sit at his seat. I just, I don't know. I don't know if that was like all S Sally and Pamela at their writing. I don't know if Rich had, it, had a role in influencing them to do slapstick comedy. I mean, I I don't know. I, I can only imagine how difficult it must be to write all those slapstick comedy directions. Maybe a lot of it was like trusting Jaleel to like improvise some shit. Like what was in your head as you were seeing um, the amount of slapstick that was in this scene? I thought immediately, I'm like, if this wasn't something that Jaleel came up with, they had a hell of a choreographer and actual stage person to stage all this because it was done so fluidly smooth. After Steve, Jeff gestures to Laura to sit down and smacks the one guy in the back of the head. Without missing a beat, he walks over to his chair, misses the chair, sits down, the chair goes back, and I think trips one of the raiders who's walking behind the chair. So, like, it's this full moment where it's just like, whoever choreographed this, they did a really good job, and the audience loved it. They did. I want to get to that moment in, in just a second. As far as what, what's happening next, after the first bit of slapstick, I think there was a moment where the maitre d' like leading Stephen Lord to their table. Like he goes from his, you know, very French accent to like, once he like walks away from the table, he passes by a server and he's like, oh, hey, nerd, table 12 alert. Although it might've been un unintentional by the writers at that time, I thought that aside from the obvious meanness of picking on nerds, that it was a cool commentary about the lack of authenticity from these fancy restaurants, about how you sometimes go into them and you feel like they're putting on an act that it really isn't genuine. So that is what I strangely found from that small moment of, hey, like going from like, oh, bonjour, Steve, to like, oh, hey, nerd, table 12, alert. It was definitely a moment that I picked up on too, where I was like, wow, so they're just faking everything here in this restaurant. And this guy's a true dick of a waiter. Like Steve hasn't done anything to you and you're already calling him a nerd. And I wonder if you have any uh, other classic lines that stood out to you. Like for me, when uh, Steve was just so amusingly adorable, like he had the, he really put the French accent on the last word of this line because he was just like so proud of himself for this reservation. He was like, oh, I ordered a head for the specialty of the Maison. And I thought the Maison was like a food, but I should 
know this. My last name is Francois. It's actually French for house. I ordered a specialty for the house. I thought it was super cool that he did that. But I did notice Steve was like very like, ooh, I got this, Laura. And he wants to impress her so bad. But then he's trying to express her, impress her in his own weird way with what he ordered. Yeah. Again, that self-absorbed need for love that he's not getting at home with his parents. Nothing else matters. The other person doesn't matter in their feelings. It's just, hey, I need my love. I need my validation. I'm Steve Urkel. God damn it. Steve is, you know, he's a dark character. He's a dark character forcing love on somebody. And the rest of the date is kind of like this weird peek into what the world would be like if Laura and Steve got together. Because Laura does not look pleasured or happy at any moment throughout this experience. No. Let's start with the fact that uh, Laura is asking Steve what he ordered, you know, translate it into normal English terms. And the moment Steve says frog legs, Laura very quickly does a spit take with her water. And then this was, I think, the slapstick that you mentioned. I thought it was just very sudden and out of hand. I didn't know how this all began, but how Steve gets up to simply ask Laura, oh, you're okay? And then all of a sudden, like, that turns into, like, the person behind him, like, just gets pushed over. And then that turns into a whole shit show of, like, you know, servers and and restaurant visitors being knocked over and women screaming and food and drink being knocked over it's like yes it was very well choreographed but at the same time it was like wow all this from steve just getting up from his chair like what a very klutzy restaurant it very klutzy i mean steve said it best he hopes that the food was better than the service because all of that occurs where it's like okay how did people on the opposite side of the restaurant get affected by steve yes (laughs) i noticed that and i didn't write that down i was like wait a minute there's a pattern here that doesn't make sense like it it would make sense if we went kind of like clockwise but it was like oh, the person behind Steve is getting affected and then all of a sudden we just zigzag across to the restaurant where other people are being klutzy and tumbling over and the line about Steve's, you know, hoping that the food was better than the service, obviously the I think the writers wrote that as like, oh, like we're the audience is seeing Steve as this klutz that's so klutzy that he makes an entire restaurant all shitty like this. Blah, blah, blah. But I actually was thinking like, you know what? No, I, I think that if this so-called fancy restaurant can easily get into this much of a shit show from someone just getting up out of their seat. No, that that says a lot about the restaurant. So I would be with Steve on that one. I would hope that the food is worth it if it means having to go through that. (laughs) Yes, I 100% agree. Once we get to what was ordered, I think the food was probably amazing because Steve ordered frog legs and these frog legs, Mm -hmm. I would eat them. They looked delicious. And personally, frog legs are delicious if any but he's half that. So that's, I believe, scene nine. I think we go into like a fade into that. And I think Steve calls him, I think he calls them his sautéed amphibians. <laughs> yes. <laughs> If he calls them the sauteed amphibians, even though they look deep fried. Got it. I thought, I mean, they looked like bland fried chicken fingers on a stick that a kid would eat. Just the way Steve was eating it, it just looked like prop food that that, that didn't have much personality to it. So interesting that you say that, knowing your story about those bland chicken wings that you ate at the restaurant in Connecticut after we <laughs> visited 90s Con. <laughs> uh, and of course, Laura is looking at Steve in speechless disgust and And I love how, you know, Steve says this line about, you know, he's in awe. He's attracted to Laura. He has his hand on his cheek. He's like, oh, my God, I'm attracted to you like a moth to a flame, a bee to a blossom. And what does he say next? A mouse to cheese. Uh, Steve Urkel, the mice eater, ladies and gentlemen, the mice eater. Anytime Steve is on screen, we're getting a reference to cheese or to mice. I'm just getting used to it and we're going to have to accept it. The cheese and mice will be a part of the next decade of our lives. Really? I dare you to tell me if like starting with the second season, if we have any more Mice Eater Urkel references. I wonder. We might. I mean, he gets his pet mouse at some point. So I'm thinking we might have a Mice Eater reference come up again. I wouldn't be Mm. surprised if we do. Okay. 
Okay. And then Laura says, like, oh, check, please. After all this madness, again, I'm wondering who is paying? Is this Uncle Ernie? Is this coming out of Stephen Laura's allowance? Who is paying for this? Yeah, who is paying? Because this is expensive and frog legs are not cheap. So someone's got to be paying for this who has money. And I imagine that with all the uh, klutziness that happened throughout the restaurant, that probably everybody's going to point back to Steve. I would imagine that he, would, he might have to pay for that, too. Yeah, but just him getting out of his chair, that's probably about $2,000 worth of damage. Yeah, because he ruined people's dinners. He probably injured a server on the job. Workman's cop. Hello. He made a French accented man speak American. Like he committed a lot of crimes. <laughs> Just so you know, French people, as soon as you speak English, you committed a crime. Right. <laughs> Exactly. And then I noticed like when Steve was having that in awe moment with Laura, he had his hand rested on his cheek. He had his arm on his food, like his whole elbow was on his plate of uh, sautéed amphibians. And I think he was like, oh, and I'm the luckiest guy. Like he kind of realized what he did by putting his arm on his food. I noticed that his suit arm wasn't dirty at all. Like you, you would expect like some fried chicken crumbs or maybe some ketchup, whatever. But no, again, to my conspiracy theory that this food was not real, he just put his arm on sauteed amphibians. Nothing on his suit looked fine. <laughs> it's, the food was dry. Everything looked very dry. The only reason why I think they used real frog legs is because that meat on a frog leg is hard to replicate. Like, it looked real to me. But that scene to me, is the best acted scene in the entire episode of Urkel really? talking with his elbow in his food. And it kind of seems so natural that he just picks his arm up, dusts it off, and just goes back to talking. Like, this is the most natural moment in life for him. Even the audience reaction was, was very muted for that moment. That was, hands down, I think the best acted moment in the entire episode. And he certainly does some acting when uh, he gets into that passive-aggressive guilt moment. So Laura says, like, oh, okay, the date isn't bad at all. And Urkel requests... Wait, what, what? I am laughing at you because your entire demeanor just changed <laughs> thinking about the rest of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got my feelings about this episode. I got my feelings about this one. Mm -hmm. Jaleel, very talented, wonderfully acted as Steve Urkel. I get that. But um, the message that is being portrayed about, you know, giving into uh, guilt and going out on a date with someone you don't want to go out with, it's it's too much. It's too much to take. So Steve gets to the point where he requests a, a small kiss on the cheek. And of course, Laura reminds him that violates their non-date, no-touching agreement. And then that's when Steve goes heavy on that passive aggressive guilt. He's like, you know, he, he's a madman. He's like, oh, why should you lower yourself just because it would mean the world to me? You'll go on hundreds of dates. I'll only go on one my whole life. I'll peak at 13. Come on. Like, you know what he's doing. And then I was hoping that Laura would be the smart, empowered woman that she was briefly earlier in the episode and not give into it and just tell him to bug off. But no, she's like, all right, just one kiss on the cheek. Fine. I love this episode, Andrew. I love it so much. <laughs> <laughs> this moment, these passive aggressiveness, like you're talking about with his reaction and Laura. Again, now thinking about this being an episode directed by two women who knows what, I mean, who knows what they've had to experience in their own dating lives and what women in some scenarios get put into and are expected to accept for a date. Like, oh, somebody guilting me into giving them a kiss or, oh, well, you should do this because it, 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 the pressure that was placed on Laura and then for her in a scenario where, I mean, do you know if you're going to be safe if you say no, if you reject this person? Let's be honest. I mean, violence occurs against women all the time from romantic situations. So thinking about this now in an adult mindset, as a kid, I would have never picked up on this. But as an adult, I'm like, hmm, OK, I kind of get that she's pressured and she may not want to stand up here because who knows what could occur. I can't imagine that anxiety that you would feel in that scenario. So that's my only forgiveness for it of like, oh, yeah, yikes, this is cringe. But maybe we're seeing something acted out in real life that part of us don't experience. Yeah, I mean, I think kids going through stuff like this where you feel responsible for somebody else's feelings and like, oh, okay, whatever, I'll go out on a mercy date. That's completely fine if they did not have any adult input. But the fact that there were 
were adults that Laura sought advice to, and they sort of led the way into her thinking that, okay, you got to go out on at least one mercy date or two in your life, like, so she obliges to a kiss. And then Urkel makes it worse because there's some random adult guy in the background taking a photo of the kiss. It turns out it's his, it's his Uncle Ernie. Another example of an adult not setting a good example. Uncle Ernie at no point said, uh, Steve, this might be kind of creepy and kind of unwelcome. He was just like, oh, sure, why not? Let's do it. Yeah, very, very weird. It was as uncomfortable to watch as Harriet's kitten heels. It was bad. I'm sorry, it was, did you say it was uncomfortable to watch as Harriet's kid in heels? Her kitten heels. So she had a kitten heel on. It's a heel with a very small heel. <laughs> Just Google kitten heels and you'll understand that these are heels that are unacceptable. And it was okay, as uncomfortable okay. to watch Steve in that moment as it was to see Harriet in those shoes. Okay. All right. All right. I got to look into that. And then Laura is appropriately outraged and cries out that the non-date is over, even though it seems like they were already at the end of the night by that point. Weren't they kind of, kind of just being like, oh yeah, Laura, this was nice. Blah, blah, blah. So that was weird. Yeah. The night was already mm -hmm. over. So for her to storm out at this point, I'm like, well, is there really reason to storm out now? But I do get it. It's very creepy to have some weird old dude bust out with a camera after you got forced to kiss somebody. In an uncredited role, I, I might add. I mean, the guy who played Uncle Ernie didn't come up on the IMDb, so he had his brief second of fame and then he just left. But yeah, I, if you hear this guy, reach out to us. I would like to know your name at least. And if you passed away, rest in peace. We, we're, we're, always think, we're always thinking of you, Uncle Ernie. Laura storms out and mm -hmm. then that is another example of empowerment that I would have loved to see more fleshed out. Laura was just like, fuck this. You took a photo of us kissing. Like, I already, it was, it was enough that I decided to forego that contractual agreement of no touching and give you just one kiss on the cheek, but now you have to take a picture and claim that, oh, it's not in the contract. No pictures. So, Laura was right to storm out. Um, I think that at the very least, Pamela and Sally let us know that oh, Steve is a dirty, no good person that Laura doesn't want to have anything to do with. So in, I guess in their way, they thought that was going to be good enough to show that uh, Laura is getting some integrity here. What do you think? It, I do think it, it's like a little statement on the end of it to be like, okay, Laura gets to choose what's going to happen to her after this entire episode of her bending to everybody else's will. And then uh, Urkel tries to follow Laura in plea. And of course, he's uh, stopped by the tablecloth that it is attached with all the food from their table. All the food drops to the floor. For some reason, a group of adults just standing by the door watching this whole thing between Steve and Laura go down, even though the climax literally didn't happen until just now. So what before then were they so interested in that they were like, oh, hey, it's going to lead to this juicy moment. I think they were waiting to close down the restaurant because I think Steve and Laura were the last two people in there. So maybe they're like, would you get out of here? We need to go home. I just want to know how did the tablecloth get inside of Steve's pants? That's the part that just did not make sense to me because it was inside his pants, almost like he tucked it inside his belt buckle. And I'm like, what were you doing at this table for that to happen? My only my only guess is that he thought the tablecloth was a napkin. Maybe he was trying to like wipe some frog leg stuff on his pants. And then he and then he thought, you know what? Maybe I dropped some frog legs on my pee pee. So he like tried to clean. <laughs> he tried to clean. <laughs> <laughs> he tried to clean there and he thought, you know what? I don't want to dirty my thing. So let me just keep it there. And then that's how it happened. I'm just trying to explain the way the logic because there is none. I mean, yeah, you're totally right. I mean, it does not make sense how a tablecloth just suddenly ended up tucked in in his pants. Uh, you know, we're going with your theory, John, because I feel like it's feasible in another universe. So I'm going with it. Um, I mean, it's how many lead... times, how many times have you been out and you have this paranoia like, oh, crap, somehow I'm going to drop food into my genitalia. I got to put a napkin in there just to make sure it doesn't happen. I <laughs> You know it's, what? Maybe only one like, time in my entire life have I ever thought about that. <laughs> oh my god! This is what happens when we record too late. Oh man! <laughs> so, um, so at this point, scene's pretty much over for me. Like we got our physical comedy in. We're headed back to the house. Was there anything else you had for the scene? No, not really. I mean, you know, obviously Urkel realizes the predicament that he's in in front of the adults between Laura and the food he drops. I actually thought in that moment where he was just like, yeah. Well, I thought he was going to give us a, did I do that? But he didn't. He, 
he just he randomly said, oh, bonjour. And then he just like runs out. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, sure. I, I can take that. That was funny. I thought bonjour, again, this is the, coming from the guy whose last name is Francois. I thought it always meant hello, but I looked on Google. It actually means good day. So you could actually say good day, both as a hello and as a goodbye. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I always thought it meant like just hello too. But once I learned that, I was like, oh, you can use it twice. I'm going to start doing that. And then that maitre d' has that look of like, what just happened? And then when he did, I, it looked like he looked into the camera. He did. He looked directly at the camera. It was like a breaking of the fourth wall moment for a second. Yeah. He probably didn't know where the camera was or just didn't pick up on the fact that like, oh, hey, you're looking straight ahead into the camera. I thought that was uh, that that was a choice. That was a choice. Thank you, Gino. Gino Contarelli? Gino Spinelli? What what was his name? Oh, I forgot. I know Gino's the first name. I forgot his last name. So (laughs) scene 10, we're back at the Winslow's house. Uh This might be the first episode where there's a scene 10. Yes, this is the first episode where there's a scene 10. This is so many scenes. Rich, geez. But we get Laura coming back to the house. Family's all in the kitchen. Harriet, Rachel, Mama Mm -hmm. Winslow, Carl. I don't believe Eddie's in the kitchen. But they're all having hot cocoa, which I'm assuming. And Carl Carl is on this pretty much floor height chair. Like the chair is done at this point and he can't reach the marshmallows. And this is where I remembered that Carl was in this episode and that he is still hilarious because his face sitting in that chair on the floor before asking for the marshmallows, I it, I sent me into laughter. So you and I had a similar thought about this. I was like, okay, this is funny. I like the physical comedy behind this. But at this point in the episode, when we're like, what, three minutes away from ending it, I felt like it was an unnecessary follow up to the B story. I feel like this was a B story that didn't need to be in this episode at all. Because, sorry, when you have Urkel as the focus, and especially it, when it plays on his dynamic with Laura, like, that's going to swallow up the whole episode. Like, something as comparatively insignificant as, oh, Carl is trying to fix his chair. Like, okay, we dealt with that from Mr. Bad Wrench. Like, Carl can't fix things. So this will get into the rating that we'll uh, do at the end of this uh, whole recap here. And... I, Laura comes in eventually, right? She comes in through the back porch door. She talks about what a disgusting night she has. Eddie is like, oh yeah, okay. So how was the food? And then uh, Carl just kind of seems to chew it off as a childhood memory that Laura will laugh about later on when she's old, rather than a failure to teach her children <laughs> that they shouldn't have to be responsible for the feelings of people that they do not genuinely want to go out with. And look, dare I say, I mean, well, actually, no, not, not even dare I say, because you, you commented on it brilliantly a strong unintentional commentary from the writers who are women about how girls and women are not taken seriously when it comes to this kind of thing when it comes to dating and the power of choice and consent carl and eddie they just chew it off like it's nothing but tell us how the food was that's the more important thing there's the patriarchy in action right there at the table and this scene is where I am 100% sure Laura broke character I laughed because when she walks in she walks in and she says oh my date was so disgusting and she stops talking and then the camera looks to Carl and comes back to her and she has this massive grin on her face like she was fighting laughing or had just finished laughing and then her face goes back to angry and she finishes her line and I screamed I screamed because I thought it was the funniest thing in the world I don't know if it, she really broke character but it was one of those moments where I'm like I feel like we're getting the realness of every actor in this episode. Yeah, I want to see that because I thought she gave a quick random look to Carl and she could have acknowledged it. She could have said something like, oh, okay, you, I'll get back to you later. Something of that nature. But no, she just gives like a quick look and then just goes back to talking about her disgusting night. So all I remember from that brief exchange when she was briefly looking at her dad in that that very low floor high chair was, oh, okay. That was odd how that wasn't addressed more for comedic benefit. And then stupid studio audience, either they were trained or they're just naive. But the moment when, you know, Eddie thanks Laura for going out with Steve basically like hey thank you for agreeing to prostitute yourself because I had this nerd help me out in math Eddie thanks Laura and he offers her the other ticket for the 
Prince concert. So one, we got two child siblings going to a Prince concert together. Imagine that. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know. I, look, I don't. I, I, I'm, I'm okay with my relationship with my brother and sister. I don't know if it, it would get to a point where I would go to a concert with them that has like very overt sexuality. I just feel like that's a thing that we wouldn't do together. I don't know if you have that dynamic with your siblings and you would go to a concert like that. My brother and I would <laughs> never go to a concert like that together. That's like me expecting him to come to a Beyonce concert with me. He'd be like, I don't listen to her. I don't understand why you want me here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And number two, why are we making Eddie out to be a sweet guy for essentially rewarding Laura for agreeing to the prostitution agreement? He was a pimp. Eddie was a pimp. Well, <clears throat> we see Laura's cut of the profits. <laughs> That's kind of what it like symbolizes because at the end of the episode, I had the same thought. I'm like, so we just kind of just brush off everything that happened here. And Laura, thank you for getting my tickets back that I gave away myself, but I didn't have the ability to tell somebody the truth and actually get them back. So you took the bullet for me. But here, here's your reward. You get to share this ticket with me. I do feel it's pretty unfair. Mm -mm -mm. And then Rachel, I love being my Toma Hopkins, but I hated her when she was talking about Mickey the dog. I don't like her now. When she tells Laura that, you know, hey, now that you've gone out with Steve, he'll leave you alone. Yeah, okay, Rachel. Because non-consensual love stalkers, when you get give in to them just once, that's all they need. They will stop stalking you. They will stop really trying to integrate themselves into your life every single second of every day. No, no, it's a drug. <laughs> like Steve thinks, oh, if I got Laura now, then I could keep getting her more and more. Mm -hmm. It just sets up a cycle for a terrible abuse <sighs> that is only going to get worse. Yeah. And then uh, I think the last moment here, Steve uh, calls, Carl answers, pretends to be an answering machine so he doesn't have to put up with him, and then uh, leaves the phone off the hook on the stool to just let Steve ramble on as if he's sending a legitimate, well, it's not called a voicemail. I think it was, what do you call it? A message back in those days. Yeah, you're just leaving a message after yeah. the beep. Beep! And then, uh, yeah, we just do that. But Carl thinks that's okay instead of being a parent and saying, hey, kid, uh, my child doesn't want to have anything to do with you. How about you uh, calm down or else, as a cop, I might have to do something about it. Yeah, somebody needs to put this child in his place and get him some counseling. That is the end of the episode. And that was a big chunk of chunkness. All right. You're waiting. What do you find so, to be the appetizer? What do you find to be the main course? What do you find to be the dessert and the junk food of this episode? So appetizer for me is the fashion. The fashion in this episode, I really feel wardrobe came through and really gave everybody some fleshed out looks. Things that worked, things that didn't work together, and a bunch of separates that I'm going to try to find into style outfits on my own. That is what drew me in as the appetizer for this episode. The entree for this is going to be Laura and Steve date storyline here. Now, it's only going to consist of all the interactions of Laura and Steve and the physical humor. It has nothing to do with Eddie or the rest of the family for me. That by itself, the fact that we got character development from Laura, we actually see her acting more in an angsty role than going from an angsty role to kind of a bitter role where she was pretty annoyed that she had to do this. But then we also see her experiencing something that we haven't seen anybody experience yet on the show. I mean, we had Rachel's moment where she went on a date with Alan, but these are adults, so it's a completely different scenario. As a kid, we've got Laura, who's about to live through this traumatic experience twice in a row now, because she had her terrible date to the dance thing, as far as Steve coming and then Eddie trying to get a boy for her. And it's like, can Laura make a romantic decision on her own? But to see that this development is occurring through the TV show, and I already know what happens in the later systems, this kind of just gave me... Mm -hmm a little enjoyment to watch for the good moments. And then for dessert, it's going to be cheese, Steve and the door scene. The door scene, that was just icing on the cake for me. It was probably my favorite scene as far as comedy in the entire episode. Um, the junk food for me is going to be everything else. Carl's storyline with the chair, pretty much all of the interaction with the adults was just junk food to me. I could have actually gone without any of it and actually just had this episode focused on the kids 100%. What do you have, John? I'm interested to hear. The appetizer, I'm going to say, I mean, it's very easy for me to go on the cold open as the appetizer.
appetizer because it's like, oh, appetizer, the first thing you eat, cold open, the first thing we see, the surprisingly short, concise, tight, family fun friendliness of the cold open got my attention. It wasn't what we see in the past where it's like, oh, okay, the cold opens are fine. I mean, they were more fleshed out. There was more going on. But this one, you really got to see a Rich Corral move it, keep a momentum moving Family Matters where it's like, all right, here we go. Boom. Like you felt like it was an elevator pitch. Kids love video games. Parents are telling them to stop playing it so much, but the parents really in their mind, they like video games and they want to hide that away from their kids. Boom. That should be a cold open. Like it was just, how can you make a quick idea into a quick scene in front of you that works because it's a, a, a nice, funny, amusing way to open the show. Like if you put that in the middle somewhere, it would be weird because it's like, wait, what was that? That quick scene didn't need to happen. It just came out of nowhere. But to open the show, it just was like, boom, fun, family-friendly humor that all families can relate to. Let's go. That's my appetizer. Oh, that main course. That main course leading Laura to believe that I guess as a female, it is her duty to go through at least one mercy date as she grows up. Like, hey, Laura, we as the adults that could have been a good role model example are letting you know that we've had mercy dates too, and you'll just have to go through it. It's just a thing. There's going to be guys that are pathetic and they're losers and you feel sorry for them, so you just have to go out with them. There, there was a lot to that that I found disappointing. I felt that the adults could have said something to lead Laura in the other direction, especially when Laura's first reaction to Eddie setting her up was, are you crazy? You a fool. Like, cool. I get that. Like, you're being set up without consent mm -hmm. with a guy that you don't want to go out with in the first place. Like, I get that anger. I get that outrage. So I wish that we could have followed through on that. And I think that the fact that it was just written as, well, Laura is going to just give in to Steve Urkel's uh, feelings, regardless of what she thinks, especially the fact that it was written by two female writers. I think it could be argued that Sally and Pamela just uh, were accepting of the societal conventions of the time, maybe writing from their own personal experience of having to go on mercy dates. And uh, they, they kind of went with that. So that was the main course. The main course, which I describe as, uh, oh, a meal with some bitterness to it you know that kind of meal where sorry andrew it's very healthy it has all the vegetables all the cabbage but you're like oh god i could i could just go for some pasta right now i can go for some pizza that's what i got i got a healthy dose of life lesson vegetables from how laura was treated with the whole steve dating dynamic in this episode that was my main course <laughs> My dessert, one of the moments that I found genuinely adorable and fun was seeing Steve and Estelle show us what could be a great episode of its own, where we get to see the parental adult role model love that Steve is not getting from his parents. And maybe we do explore that later on the show's run. Maybe we do. I'm not sure. But um, to now know that Herb and Diane are somewhere in buttfuck Wisconsin trying to be away from their child, and here is Estelle who can give him that love that he doesn't need to get from Laura because Laura doesn't want the love from him. Positive example of love in Steve's life through Estelle. Because everybody else, if you think about it, everybody else is just like, oh God, that nerd, Steve, that loser. Oh God. Like, I think Estelle is literally the only one that says like, oh, what an adorable, cute boy. He locks the door. He may eat mice, but he probably eats mice with tender love and care. That was my dessert. The B story, just like you, is my junk food. And the complicated thing with the B story is that it's a funny B story. Like, I like leaning into that idea that Carl is the typical sitcom dad who has this pride about like, oh, I want to fix things. I want to fix things. And then Harriet, sitcom wife. No, you can't fix things. Call a plumber. Call a repairman. Carl tries to fix it. It works against him. In this particular instance, I thought, especially when we got to the floor height chair scene, I thought that was funny, but it was badly misplaced. Why? Because Urkel himself and the Urkel Laura dynamic, especially, it sucks up a lot of energy. So much energy that anything else is just going to be like, all right, this is just going to be a throwaway thing that we have to kill five or six minutes of time. Now, as opposed to the last episode where that B story of, uh, what was it? It was uh, Carl, Harriet, Rachel, Mama Winslow, they're going to go to Daryl's 40th birthday party. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh my God, that could have been a great A story. Looking into that dynamic of Carl and Daryl and how Carl sees Mama Winslow or how Mama Winslow sees Carl compared mm -hmm. to how she sees Daryl. Great. But with this one, it was like, it was a funny B story, but it was badly misplaced. And 
I don't think I could see that as an A story because we already did it through Mr. Bad Wrench. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, would, do you think we could see an entire episode of Carl and his chair antics? The only way I would accept it if it was Carl's pink chair in the living room. That'd be the only way because it seems like he was more attached to that chair in the beginning of the series than any other thing. So if we had that chair being like a whole episode of Carl's chair, I would have been down for it. And it would have been a fun episode of recap because literally in Carl's stubbornness to try to revive and fix his pink chair, you and I would have probably had the same thing. Carl, get rid of the fucking chair now. It needs to go. (laughs) Yes, get that thing out. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, the junk food is the B story once again, but in a different way than it was the last episode. It was just a B story that did not need to be there. I, I could argue that you could have had an entire episode of just that A story of Urkel forcing Laura to go out on a date with him. I think that was such a powerful story that the audience certainly, I mean, they loved it. You loved it. I'm I'm sure you wouldn't have minded seeing that for the entire 22 or 23 minutes. Not at all. We could have brought in Penny. We could have brought in some other characters. This could have been an episode focused solely on the child actors, and it still would have been amazing. Yeah. Penny accidentally runs into Laura and finds her out on a date with Steve. And then who knows how that goes with the conversations and the gossip at school. So yeah, that could have been a full episode. We didn't have to have the, you know, little random aside of Carl and his chair thing. We already saw that in Mr. Bad Wretch. So that is my rating, good sir. Our next episode recap. This is a great cold open for this next coming yeah. episode. Because we get somebody it, so. in this cold open that we've never had in a cold open before. Really? Okay. Yeah. Next episode is called Sitting Pretty, episode 18 of season one. Uh, Rich Corral, man, he is on a run of these episodes. This is uh, the, the one, two, three. This will be the fourth episode in a row that he's directed this season. Wow. And this is the final countdown. We're in the final stretch of this first season. Yeah, we are. We are. Yep. We have 22 episodes and we're on episode 18. We're getting close there. Original air date, February 23rd, 1990. All right. As always, for you listening, you can find us on your socials for now. At Family Matters, we watch Pod, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Threads, YouTube. Andrew, how can people follow you? You can follow me on all social media platforms that are major. So Twitter, which is now X, um, Facebook, Instagram, Threads, and TikTok by just searching Vandertunt, V-A-N-D-E-R-T-U-N-T. I am back on Facebook, but if you want to contact me, You have to do it through the uh, Facebook podcast page. Don't contact my direct page personally if you have like a message about the show because I'm not going to read it. I do just say that in advance because I just don't go into those DMs. But if you write the podcast page, I've got you covered. I love how you make it seem like there's either dirty shit on your DMs or you will file a restraining order if somebody (laughs) is supposed to DM on your personal Facebook page. I will. I cannot tell you how many unsolicited D pics I've gotten. No more. Don't send me that pet crap, please. Really? Are you serious? I am 100% serious. That's why I don't really ever check my DMs on Facebook. And that was one of the things that really drove me away from Facebook. But I get tons of unsolicited D pics and I don't want any more. I don't look at that mailbox. I don't care what's in it. If you want to actually reach me and talk, do it through the podcast page. I will message you there. It takes a certain um, self-absorbed weird pride to be like, hey, you didn't ask for it but I know you want to see my junk here. Like, why do people do that? (laughs) I I don't know. I don't get it. Like, maybe it looks pretty in a picture to you, but keep it to yourself. I don't want to see it. I didn't ask for it. So don't send it to me, please. (laughs) Yes. And please don't send us to D-Pix to our Family Matters podcast page. We don't want that either. We don't want that either. I think that's about it, man. I mean, I think unless there's anything else, you are free to sign us off in your classic way, man. I have to tell you, like a plate of food that is in four buildings away from a bathroom, let the deliciousness ring.